Hello, everyone. Grace and peace to you. Welcome. Welcome to the Morning Star Bible Study. Yes, if you are uh, watching, uh, those of you who are coming in, amen. Come and join us. Come and join us for our Bible study this afternoon. Grace and peace to you. I'm so excited to be here this afternoon and to just share with you. Uh, I am so honored today. Thank God things worked out. And we have Lady T who is uh, facilitating for us. So if you have uh, comments, just put them in. Uh, any questions about where to watch this later, just put those in the comment box on Facebook and she'll be able to respond. So we thank God. Well, welcome, welcome again to everyone. Come on in. Um, our, our lesson for today or our, in this particular series uh, is uh, the topic, church is God's idea. Church is God's idea. And last week, we just opened up a little bit to let you know what we'll be studying and kind of the format. I ask you to please uh, grab a notebook, grab your Bible or your uh, electronic device that has uh, access to the scriptures, because I want you to read what I'm reading and to see what I am seeing. Uh, there will be times that I'll ask you to read on your own, and I would love for you to do that. I would love for you to have your own time uh, just reviewing some of the notes and some of the scriptures uh, that we uh, cover here in the lesson. Again, as, uh, for those of you who are just coming on, welcome, welcome, welcome. The Lord bless you. I am going to uh, pray a, a prayer just to start us out that the Lord will be with us in our time and the word of God this afternoon or this evening. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. Lord, we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. You are a faithful God and we exalt you and we bless you. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you be with us this afternoon, that you would touch our hearts and minds, that you would illuminate your word to us. And Father, that you would allow us to hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Father, we pray for every need, uh, for those who are coming on and uh, uh, who will come on in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would continue to show yourself strong in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, all right, we're, uh, we're only about three minutes in, uh, but we wanna get started. We want to stay true to our time, which is about 30, 40 minutes max. And so we're going to get started. If you weren't here at the beginning, uh, like I said, we were just are uh, just a couple minutes in. Uh, please know that this will be posted. You can go back and watch it. We're also going to post it on our YouTube channel, as well as uh, a page for Bible study on our website. All right. All right. So we're going to get started. So last week, just to give you kind of a little bit of a recap, we looked at uh, kind of the foundation of what we will be doing over the next few weeks. So I just want to give you a quick little recap. We kind of talked about the importance of understanding the, the concept that church is God's idea for us to understand, uh, especially in a time when uh, the word of God, I mean, it's always been challenged, but the truth of who Jesus is, uh, is being challenged in our generation. Uh, and so we just want to make sure uh, that we uh, know what the word of God says. And we are looking in the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's so important from a biblical perspective that we understand uh, some of the major uh, tenets or major uh, concepts around the church. What is the church? Uh, whose idea <laughs> is the church? Who is backing the church? Uh, what is the church made of or who is the church made of? Those are some of the questions that we will be covering. Uh, today, I'm going to finish uh, laying kind of a foundation for us, and then we'll begin to go uh, break down and look at, into some of those other uh, areas. 
And so, as I mentioned last week, the first time we see the concept of church, it is in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we see words like congregation. Uh, we see words as assembly, uh, like assembly. We see words like the Lord's assembly. <laughs> and of course, uh, gathering. And lastly, community. Uh, these are some of the words that we see in the Old Testament that also refer to the concept of church. Now, last week, uh, I, I went to uh, 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 try to lay a foundation of some, the three major characters I see kind of uh, that are foundational in understanding the church. And so we're going to look today a little bit at one of them, and that's Adam. We talked about Adam, we talked about Abraham, and we talked about Jesus, or I mentioned them. These are the three major characters that we want to examine to lay a foundation for uh, uh, the, the concept of church. Now, when we look at Adam, I'm going to uh, ask you to grab your Bibles. I want you to grab your Bibles. Uh, I want you to go to uh, Genesis uh, chapter number two, Genesis chapter number two. So go to your Bibles. Uh, you can also write it down first. That's what I like to do. Write the text down first before you go to it. That way you don't have to worry about what I, you know, trying to figure out or find what I said. So make a note, Genesis chapter number two. We're going to look at some verses in chapter two. And we will also look at some verses in chapter three. So what am I trying to establish here? I'm trying to establish that uh, God's desire to tabernacle or to be in relationship with Adam. And when I talk about Adam, I'm, I'm talking about Adam as representative of humanity. So he was the first uh, he, uh, human being uh, that God created. Uh, what's so phenomenal about Adam is that um, and we'll get to it in, in verse seven. So I'm kind of jumping ahead, but we want to establish uh, God's desire to tabernacle or to be in relationship with Adam or with humanity. We also want to establish that God had a plan to redeem, to save, and to reconcile humanity. So Adam's fall did not take God by surprise. Um, God had a plan. And we see kind of that signal a little bit, even in Genesis, uh, that he uh, had a plan to redeem uh, man, um, humanity. So when I use the term man, I'm referring to humanity. I want to be politically correct. But if I use the word man, I'm referring to humanity. God always had a plan. The third thing, that I would like to establish uh, is that this is our first view at the institutions that God created. The very first institution he created was marriage and the family. And you said, Pastor, well, just because he created Adam and Eve, it doesn't mean that uh, he was, uh, that they were married. And it is clear throughout these texts. I want you to read it yourself. Genesis chapter two, Genesis, well, definitely chapter three, chapter two, chapter three, that what you will find is Eve is referred to as Adam's wife over and over Adam and his wife. So the first institution that God created is marriage. And this is going to be important to us because we are going to come back to this. Uh, he not only instituted uh, a marriage, but he instituted the family because he said that you should be fruitful and multiply. The first institution was not the church. The first institution was marriage and the family, which is one of the reasons why the enemy tries to attack marriages so, uh, so uh, fiercely. Anything that God designed, the enemy comes to pervert it, just like he did with, just like he did with Eve. He told Eve, you won't surely die. So whatever God has ordained, it is clear that God has ordained marriage, he will come and attack it uh, uh, fiercely. And of course, we see that in our society. We, uh, we, we see it in our families. We see it in our own lives. And so we have to be purposeful in understanding. So the other thing that's important about uh, uh, the institution of marriage 
uh, in the beginning uh, is that Jesus uh, refers to the church as the bride of Christ. So it tells you two things. It tells you how important the first institution is, uh, which is marriage. And it tells you that the first institution is symbolic of, the, uh, of what we see uh, in the development or the institution of the church, uh, which we see in the New Testament. Uh, and when I say church, specifically ecclesia, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we'll get to that. The fourth thing that we want to see, lastly, is that these texts, Genesis chapter two and chapter three, uh, establishes the view of God toward marriage as the church. And of course, as I mentioned, the bride of Christ. So the first institution uh, is uh, the church. And then of course, lastly, I'm uh, sorry, the first institution is marriage, I'm sorry. And then lastly, of course, the relationship of God to the church as the bride of Christ. These are some very important uh, concepts that, that we establish because it is so easy for us to be caught up in, uh, uh, in, in popular culture, in modernity, and what we see in the places that we uh, view. It, it, there's their opinion on marriage or their opinion on the church or their opinion on what's important uh, and, and to our lives in terms of the word of God. And here we see it. And you know what I also was thinking about when I was thinking about uh, marriage and the church and kind of God establishing uh, these things in these first few texts, uh, how important we are to God, how much God loves us. I mean, when you, at the very root of it all, it is a love story that God created uh, Adam, that he created humanity, and that God loved uh, uh, Adam. God loved uh, the creation of a human being, so much so that he went to great lengths to make sure that we were brought back in relationship with him. Regardless of the decisions that were made by the first Adam, he made uh, uh, sure that there was a way through the second Adam that we would be brought back, which is Jesus Christ that we would be brought back in relationship with God. Just some of the powerful uh, lessons we see as we go through this text. So if we look at verse seven, uh, and I'm not gonna go through all of it because I do wanna uh, go through a few more things to, this afternoon, but we'll look at some of these verses. Verse seven, Genesis chapter two, he's, it says, and the Lord uh, formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we're here we see what is so unique about us as human beings. What is so unique is that out of all of the things that God created, I mean, God created other things out of dust. We see cattle. We see other things with flesh like us that has flesh like human beings. But what's different, according to the scriptures, is that God himself breathed into Adam. So we are the only thing that God created that has the breath of God. So we're the only thing that God who created that has a living soul. So everything else that God created, when it, uh, when it, when, when it dies, you know, when the animals die, whether it's birds or fowl or fish, uh, when they die, that is the end. There is no more. But when we uh, leave, depart from this body, our soul lives forever. The Bible tells us that our soul will either live in the presence of God and heaven or our soul uh, will be damned again. Uh, and we believe, according to the scriptures, that there's a real heaven and there's a real hell. And these are important things for us to repeat because there's so uh, many who are teaching there is no real hell. Uh, I even uh, heard, uh, I guess it was a few uh, years ago, that the Pope himself had to back up uh, uh, some of the comments he made about there being a literal hell. Uh, uh, but according to the scriptures, there is, but I've got good news. <laughs> hell was not created for us. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. We have a decision 
to make. And if we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, hell is not our home. Heaven is our home. Hell was not created for us. Heaven was created for us. And so we have a choice. We'll, we'll talk about that as we go along in the study. But the Bible talks about in verse uh, eight and nine that there was a garden that was planted in eastward of the of uh, in Eden, and there he put uh, the woman, uh, the man that he had formed, uh, out of the ground. And of course, he showed him everything that he had in the garden, all of the things that were prepared for him. I love this that God, when God, there was nothing that Adam had to do except for name what God had created. Everything was there. Everything was there, fruit, vegetables, everything, water, everything you needed to live and to thrive uh, was there in the garden. And uh, the Bible tells us that every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If we uh, jump down to verse 16, 17, and 18, it says that the Lord commanded Adam saying that every tree in this garden you can have, uh, you can eat freely of it, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you should not eat it. And the day that you do, you will surely die. And the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. And the Bible says that he creates a, a help meet from him. So it's important to know for us to see again, that it is always God's intention for us to have what we need, to live in a peaceful environment. It was God's intention, uh, as we'll see uh, with the punishments that were handed down, not that we uh, our days be full of trouble. It was not God's idea that our days are full of agony and trials and, and uh, that we would work by the sweat of our brow. And those were not God's intentions when he created uh, Adam. And so through Jesus Christ, we are brought back in relationship with God. It is all. And so even though we are uh, still uh, living in the dispensation, we haven't gone to heaven yet. Uh, as uh, when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, we become citizens of the kingdom of God. And there are certain things in the kingdom of God as citizens of the kingdom of God we have access to. So yes, we still have trials. Uh, yes, we still have afflictions. But the Bible tells us that, you know, that uh, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Uh, he, you know, he tells us that, uh, you know, uh, that there, there are certain uh, 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 rules in the kingdom. And as we abide by those uh, rules, uh, that we have the fruit of the kingdom, that we live according to those things. So that's healing uh, and forgiveness is number one. Uh, that's, uh, you know, the, having access uh, to the throne of grace. And so there's several things, but those are the things that God intended for us to uh, have. And, you know, we'll see in just a few minutes that one of the, uh, uh, the uh, condemnations or the judgments for sin is death. Uh, it's one of the things that we, uh, I, well, I personally, <laughs> one of the things that I personally hate the most is grieving. I am, I mean, it is, I, I just don't like to grieve. And, um, and and none of us do, especially when we have a profound loss, the loss of a mother, the loss of a father, loss, loss of a spouse, the loss of children. They are profound losses. Some people are swallowed up in grief. Uh, and uh, they never make it out of it because it's so painful. Well, the, God never intended for us to die. That was never his intention. The Bible tells us in the end time that both death and hell will be cast in the lake of fire. And the Bible refers to death as the last enemy. This gives us a picture of what God desired for us from the beginning what it is that he had in mind for us. And the plan, which we'll see through Abraham and Jesus Christ, I've put, used those characters kind of as tent poles for us to look at, to, to bring us back to the concept of church as God's idea. Um, and so we see uh, that God always intended 
good things for his creation. And that is not changed. Um, so let's go back to, let's go back to Genesis verse 21. Let's jump down to 21. It said that the Lord caused a deep to come sleep to come upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up that flesh thereof and the rib which the Lord had taken from man he made woman and brought the woman to the man and Adam said this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh uh and so i'm going to get to verse uh 25 but i will say here again um you know i i the whole concept or topic of this bible study series is church is god's idea but what we also see here <laughs> is marriage is god's idea <laughs> Uh, marriage is God's idea. And uh, because the, uh, when you come together in the union and become one flesh, uh, you know, when that, when that, when that union is broken, uh, uh, people describe it as death itself. People describe it as, you know, talk about grieving, one of the most difficult things they experience, even when people feel that they really had no other choice. Um, uh, they, it's a, just a difficult thing because it was, uh, God's uh, cons idea that the two would become one. And so separating that is just really a traumatic, this is not about marriage, but we're looking at it because it is one of the uh, uh, symbols that's used um, uh, to explain one of the concepts that's used um, for the idea of the church or the concept of the church. So he said in verse 25, and they were naked and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Again, they had not sinned and they were not ashamed. So then I want you to look at verse number three, chapter number three. Also, I'd like to point out that even though I skipped around, I would like for you to read all of chapter number one, all of chapter number two, and all of chapter number three. And I know you've read it before, but read it again. The word of God is the living word. And every time you read it, especially if you have the spirit of God, something will uh, grab a hold of your heart and bear witness. One of the things that I found is that when we get in the word of God, it, it, it builds us up. It gives us capacity, it gives us strength. So getting in the word of God is one of the most powerful things you can do in order to live life. Uh, in order to face tomorrow, in order to uh, uh, go through uh, whatever it is we have to go through, good, bad, and different, uh, getting into the word of God. I don't need to be honest with you. I don't care whether you're reading Genesis or Revelation. It doesn't matter whether you're reading the Psalms or the Proverbs. It's something about the word of God, reading it, studying it, digesting it, meditating on it. It is so powerful. It's I, I, I often use the example for those of you who are baby boomers of Popeye the sailor man when he pops open this uh, can of spinach and eats it and he gets his strong muscles. That's what the word of God does for us. It gives us the strength that we need for the day. You'll find it in the word of God. Genesis chapter number three is the, uh, it's referred to uh, in the scriptures as the fall. If you, if you, depending on what kind of Bible you have, they'll have subtitles and NIV it's called the fall. So here we will, uh, for the sake of time, I won't go through all of it, but here in the story, and I want you to read it. We find that the serpent comes to Eve and he tells Eve, I know what God said, but it's not, it's not quite like that. So uh, Eve uh, uh, disobeys um, uh, God's law she, that she got from Adam. It, that's what we get from the scripture because God told Adam. And, um, and of course she gives it to Adam and Adam uh, uh, sins as well. So uh, one of the powerful scriptures that I love here in the chapters, in this chapter is verse eight, where it says, um, and, uh, and this is the KJV, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam his wife Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden so when they uh when they ate of the fruit 
And we don't know exactly what the fruit was, but we know that they ate of the fruit. And when they ate of the fruit, they realized that they were naked. Before then, they didn't know. They didn't have the knowledge of good and evil. They And so they ate uh, when they, during this act of disobedience, they lost their innocence. So they took fig leaves and they sewed to co- uh, put them together to cover themselves. And that's what we try to do when we, when we, when we uh, violate the law of God. One of the first things we do is we try to hide from God. It's just a natural reaction. Uh, children, if they do something that their parents don't like, they try to hide it. Just a natural reaction. You don't want that. Uh, uh, that it, you don't want to what that feels like. Whether that's disappointment they have in you, whether that's judgment they have in you, we we tend to want to hide. And, and, and cover ourselves. What's so beautiful about this is God has this encounter with him. First of all, uh, God, in the cool of the day, he would come to a tabernacle with Adam. And it, again, uh, the whole notion of the church is that it's always been God's desire to, to tabernacle or to dwell with us, to connect with us. It's always been God's desire to hang out <laughs> with us. And so uh, he, he uh, went in the cool of the day, the Bible said, this is such a beautifully poetic verse. So he comes looking for Adam and he said, Adam, where are you? You know, we're not talking about this but uh, we're talking about church has got idea, but this is, these are some powerful uh, verses here. Adam, where are you? And so Adam uh, says that I, I was naked. And he said, who told you you were naked? <laughs> Did you eat of the tree? And so uh, Adam uh, went on to blame the woman. The woman blames the serpent. Please read it. I want you to read it for yourself. The woman blames the serpent and then God passes down the judgment. And when God passes down the judgment, Adam has a judgment. The serpent, well, the serpent has a judgment. Adam has a judgment. Eve has a judgment. Everybody has a judgment that's been placed on them as a result of uh, the transgression or the disobedience. So God, what God did uh, as part of the punishment is he put them out of the garden. He put them out of the garden. So now they're out of the place that they were in terms of their relationship and access to God because sin cuts us off. Don't, don't worry. That's what grace does for. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ is for. So I got good news, but grace cuts us off from God. The Bible in uh, verse 24 of that text says, after he drove man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubims, a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So so, uh, sin cut him off from access to God, the access that he had with God. Uh, But the good news is God had a plan. The good news is that God never, ever, ever intended for uh, Adam to be cut off forever or humanity to be cut off forever. I want you to look at a verse with me. I've come to love this verse. I always talk to the church about uh, my favorite scriptures, and I have a lot of them. But uh, I want you to look at Luke chapter number three. Luke chapter number three. And we'll be winding down in a few minutes. Uh, Luke chapter number three. I want you to look at two verses, verse 23 and verse 38. Uh, Chapter number three, verse 23 and 38. So I'm going to have to pick this up a little closer. And Jesus himself being uh, began to be about 30 years of age, being as it was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Now, this is verse 23. This is a genealogy. And so this is a genealogy from Joseph, even though Joseph wasn't Jesus' biological father, because the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. And of course, that she was overshadowed you know, by the Spirit of God, so that he does not, Jesus does not have an earthly father. It is the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, so the conception of Jesus Christ is an immaculate conception. That's what we hear that term. So that means that it wasn't from a semen of a man. It was the Holy Spirit that overshadowed 
uh, Mary. So when we look at the genealogy in Matthew, we see that from Mary. But when we look at the genealogy from um, Joseph, verse 23 starts that. Verse 38 ends the genealogy. And it says, "Who, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. I cannot tell you what the scripture does to me because it lets us see very clearly Adam was not tossed out forever. He put him out of the garden, put guards with flaming, with flaming swords, like you're not coming back here. You're not, you're not gonna have access to this tree of life. Not this way, but I've got a plan. Hallelujah. And my plan is the son of God, the only begotten son of God. I've got a plan. He's going to come into the earth. He will redeem you uh, from the enemy and bring you back in right relationship with me. I prepared a place for you. You might, you, you know, what you had, you, you got the judgment. And so that's what we're living in now. But I've got good news. And that's what the gospel means. The gospel means good news. I've got good news for you. This is not how the story ends. I've got a way for you to come back. He says, Adam, which is the son of God. So that meant even before Jesus came, not only did he have a plan, God always, all, we talk about dispensations because it helps us understand times and errors that we see God acts in certain ways. But the truth is uh, we are in the dispensation of grace, but God has always shown grace, always shown grace. Uh, but we see in Jesus Christ that grace has a name, but God has always shown grace. And so the good news is that even when Adam, before Adam was, before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. And I'll give you that re uh, uh, text, reference text, uh, to let us know that from the beginning, God had a plan to reconcile us. That from the beginning, God had a plan so that we would dwell with him and he with us. God had a plan to call out a people and put his name on it. And that's what we talk about when we talk about the church. All right, so I've got a couple more minutes. I'm going to take them. I'm going to take a couple of more minutes. Um, and then we'll uh, look into our, uh, uh, we'll just, yeah, we'll look at our text. I'll give you a few words and then we'll pick up from here next week. All right, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number 16, Matthew chapter number 16, and we're going to look at verses 13 through 18. Again, a little trick in Bible study is write down the text first, and that way if I keep going, you don't have to say, what is the text again? Don't look for it, write it down first, just a little, just a little, uh, hopefully a little helpful hint. Um, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. Now, this is the very first time that the word church is used in the New Testament. Remember I told you in the Old Testament how it was used. It was called uh, congregation, assembly, the Lord's assembly, gathering, and community. You know, we see the tabernacle. We see Moses standing in the door of the tabernacle. You know, we see the assembly of God. So we see all these things in the Old Testament. So it was also referring to the same concept as church. And we're going to get to it in just a second. But I want to read this uh, these scriptures for you. Um, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, uh, Caesarea Philippi, sorry, um, had, had been the site of, uh, uh, for, uh, for idolatry uh, for years. But the Bible says that Jesus came into this uh, area and he said to the disciples, who do uh, people say, or men, people say, the son of man is. And uh, they replied, some say you're John the Baptist. Uh, others said e Elijah um, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And even today, we'll get to it. But even today, no, some people will not call him the son of God. They'll call him a prophet, but not the son of God. Um, and then he says, but who do you say that I am? This is critical for the church. 
It is critical for the body of believers who call ourselves Christians. It is critical for those who bear the name of Jesus Christ to fully understand who he is. So the question was not just the disciples, but the question is to us today. So Simon answered and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Messiah, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the one that we've been waiting for from the beginning. Back in, back in the, in, in, uh, and uh, Genesis, it says that, you know, you will bruise his heel and he will, he will bruise your heel. You will bruise his head. Then we see uh, in Abraham, we'll talk about Abraham next week. He said, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. Early in the scriptures, we see references to Jesus. We see references to the Messiah, to the one who will come to redeem his people. And so he said, who do you say that I am? So they had the, Peter, Simon Peter had the revelation. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the anointed one, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father, which is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, and the rock is the truth of who Jesus is. This is foundational. This is essential that we have a hold as a body of Christ, as the people of God. It is essential that we have a hold on this, uh, 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 the scripture. And that is that on the truth of who Jesus is, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. Remember we talked about the kingdom of God. Uh, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on the earth, he said, I'll bind in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose. So now he's given the church a uh, kingdom authority. We're going to keep on. Then he ordered disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now I'm going to unpack this text uh, over the next few Bible studies, uh, but I want to just look at the word church. Oh Lord, I got three minutes. Um, so I tell you what I'll do. I won't do it this week, but I'll tell you what we're going to do in our next session. We're going to look at the word church there. It's a Greek word that means ecclesia. That's well translated from or, or, or transliteration from the word uh, 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 ecclesia to church. Um, and ecclesia literally means uh, the called out ones. And we're going to look at that. It, it was, I, I referred a couple of times to the Old Testament. It actually appeared 115 times in the New Testament. Um, and in our time today, uh, you know, we'll see in the New Testament um, that his counterpart uh, uh, was translated, as I mentioned before, congregation assembly. And so we're going to look at the definition of the church. Uh, I will say this, one of the reasons why we go back to the Greek is because uh, when we look at the word uh, from the Greek meaning, it gives us deeper meaning and understanding. Um, just to give you one example, if we see the word love in the Bible, uh, we can, we'll we see over and over and over as love, but if we look into the Greek word, we'll see five different words that the Greeks use for love, and that'll help us understand exactly what kind of love that this referring to in the text. So we're going to be looking at the Greek uh, word ekklesia, and we're going to define the church next week. So it's going to be an exciting Bible study. Please, please, please tune in next week, same time, seven o'clock. We go for about uh, 30, 40 minutes max. And we're getting into the word of God. Bring your uh, Bible, bring your notes, and let's see what the word of the Lord said. This is one of the most important things you can do is get in the word of God, study the word of God, hide it in your heart so that the word of God will not just keep you from sin, but embolden you, give you strength, give you courage, renew you. I mean, it's a way in which we communicate uh, with God, even through his word, uh, especially those who are baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit and the Word connect. Uh, so it's so exciting. I want to invite you, if you're in the uh, Yonkers area, please come visit us at Morning Star Church every Sunday morning in the month of August, 10 a.m. Just go to welcome to morningstar.org 
Again, that's welcome to T.O. Morningstar.org, and you will find all the information on how to find us. I also would like to ask you to check out our events, our morning altar. We're in the midst of morning uh, uh, of summer sizzle. We have a different prayer leader every week. Our own Pastor Kathy is leading this week. Uh, I will be leading next week, so I'm so excited. Six o'clock in the morning. All the information is right there for you on our website, welcome to morningstar.org. And lastly, of course, but not least, I wanna give you the opportunity to give. Uh, if you go to our website, click on online giving, and we wanna invite you to sow in the Morningstar Church, sow into this ministry, sow into good ground. And according to all of the scriptures that we see, uh, according to what the Bible says, God has set up a, uh, a system of sowing and reaping. And so we want to offer you the opportunity to sow in the Morning Star Church. The Lord bless you. I want to end with prayer. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you, God, for speaking to us from the scriptures. Father, we pray for every listener, for those who will listen later, for those who will listen again. Father, touch our hearts that your word will fall on good ground, take root and bring forth fruit. Father, we thank you for every one of your children, oh God, who hear this word, Father, that every need is met, whatever the prayer requests are, whatever the needs are, that every need is met. And Lord, for those who do not know you in the pardon of their sins, Lord, that you would grant unto them a heart of repentance so that they will cry out, what must I do to be saved? And we thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings to you all. Thank you again for joining us. And we'll see you back again next week. God bless you.